first panel. <laughs> I am um, super honored to be running this Horror of the Everyday panel. My name is Rachel Miller, um, and I'm gonna briefly let our panelists introduce themselves. So we'll start with Nicole and head down the line if that's all right. Uh, I'm Nicole Gu. Uh, I've made a bunch of different books, including Forest Hills Bootleg Society last year, um, Everyone is Tulip, uh, Shadow of the Batgirl for DC, and Fuck Off Squad. And my newest one <laughs> that we were talking about probably today is called Pet Peeves, and it was put out by Avery Hill. Awesome. Hey, I'm Beth Hetland. Um, I teach at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I have a new book coming out in March called Tender with Fantagraphics I'm really excited about. I've been kind of secretly doing horror comics, and then now this is very publicly doing horror comics. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm King Ray. I do mo mostly mini comics right now. My mini comic, Phone Stone, was nominated for the Ignatz last year, which is a... a dystopian horror. Hi, I'm Julia Graffer. Uh I make kind of, I guess they're horror comics, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're kind of uh, different from what people expect when they think of horror, I think. Uh, and I've published three graphic novels with Fantagraphics and uh, a bunch of self-published mini-comics. And a guide to making zines on a photocopier that made a lot of people mad. <laughs> oh, no. That's my claim to fame. <laughs> I like it when you make a book that makes someone mad. I yeah. feel like that, then you're doing the right thing. <laughs> well, welcome. If we can welcome our panelists, everyone. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I'm so excited about this panel because I get to ask my favorite question to ask ever, which is, what scares you all? <laughs> <laughs> that question. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, my book is about um, basically struggling through creative endeavors and self-sabotage. So I think that is uh, something that is kind of terrifying to me, unable to reach your goals through your own fears and shortcomings. I mean, of so many things, I guess. <laughs> um, in the book, specifically, like the idea of self-sacrifice at the cost of anything or like an extreme iteration of that, but also just in my daily life, like spiders. And, <laughs> um, uh, sometimes my cat, if they're being too spooky, like, I don't know, the like dead birds on the sidewalk. Like. <laughs> if your cat's staring at something that's not there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ghosts, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the future. <laughs> I think most, a lot of my work is about uh, existing in public as like a trans person and the feet, you know, it's a scary place right now. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so last night I was hanging out in the bar at the hotel and they were playing the news for some ungodly reason where people are just trying to relax. Like, <laughs> uh, and on the Chiron it said, uh, that a man who had been caving was now trapped 3,000 feet underground. Uh, that scares me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then they had a woman with four children who was trapped inside of her car with them during a flood. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and they played the 911 call, which you couldn't hear because it was in the bar, but uh, they helpfully put subtitles. Uh, uh, of like her children crying for help and her saying, well, the water is rising up above the seats now. They saved her, they're fine. Uh, that scares me a lot too. Yeah, I went um, to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky once and got separated from my group. Wow, fuck and that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my friend and I were like looking at the two different like paths that we could take and I'm pretty sure we went into an alternate dimension uh -uh. Um, by just uh -uh. choosing a different path. Like, anyway. <laughs> is anything spelunking related is just a big yeah. no. Yeah, <laughs> enclosed spaces. Yeah. Um, I did a comic about that, about caving. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, the Descent is one of my yes. most terrible <laughs> yes. Yes. movies ever. Okay, the scene, like, right at the beginning where there's, like, a little collapse. Oh, that, yeah. I can't, like, I faint. I fainted <laughs> the first time that I watched it. Yeah, was, yes. Yeah, from the jump. Just no good. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I guess we've kind of already started talking about it, but 
How do you see those elements of what scares you showing up in your work? Especially like these books that we're kind of focusing on um, in this panel. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I feel like that's a lot of how I start my comics is I'm thinking about what's been scaring me recently and I try to think of a situation I can put it in. So I, like one of the comics I just made uh, before SPX, I was thinking about like neighborhood, suburban idealism and what it's like when you don't fit in mm -hmm. and how badly that can go. <laughs> <laughs> I think my book is pretty directly related to like my own personal trauma through metaphor. <laughs> so it, it's a, I'm not gonna say it's one to one, I didn't have a creepy dog, but uh, I think it's very apparent through the work what it is that scares me, mm -hmm. I guess. And, and that one is about obviously uh, the way that we get in our own way and, so, and create a struggle and all of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I find needles very scary. There's kind of a, a gruesome scene in Vision with a needle. Mm. Yes, uh, it's so great. <laughs> yeah, another time that I faint a lot is when I have to get a shot, which is <laughs> really embarrassing. Uh, and, but then there's like the kind of more mundane overarching horror of the story, which is uh, that the people that you love and the people who love you can still uh, manipulate you and hurt you. Mm. Um, mm -hmm and it's hard to defend yourself against them. You know, you can't, real life is not always where you can just be like, oh, that's a bad person and I'm gonna call the police, you know? Right. You, a lot of times there are people who are very difficult to deal with that you nonetheless have to deal with. Uh, and that can be kind of, not like a, a horror movie type of horror, well, most horror movies, I guess, that's, mm -hmm. Elevated horror probably deals with this, uh, but it is a kind of a creeping dread and misery, and I think self-recrimination too, because you wonder why you can't get out of that situation. Yeah. So it's not like it's a different kind of scary, but I find that pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah, I think that like the internal component, a lot of what happens with the character in the book has to do with her trying to exert control in a lot of different ways of the people around her and her own body in the settings and scenarios she tries to build up. And I think like, to me, there's something really terrifying about how powerful our, like we are to exude that pressure or like not know where that desire comes from. Is it external? Is it internal? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Like all of those elements about just existing and trying to navigate that, um, for me is really trying to tease that apart a little bit and see like how far can it go? How, how loud can you turn the dial? Yeah, yeah, I think like those two elements that Julia, you were talking about and then Beth, this idea of like we're creating our own reality that's like maybe a little bit different than other people's and we're kind of pushing it to the extreme or conversely that other people are not exactly who we expect them to be. Um, that really scares me. <laughs> um, probably the most terrifying thing, now that I'm thinking of it. I'm like in an existential crisis right now. <laughs> <laughs> no better place to have it than in front of. Exactly, yeah. in front of everyone. Just one of the many fine experiences we offer here at SPX. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, existential dread for your um, first panel. Um, yeah, it's not even noon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've only had three coffees. Um, I'm kind of interested because most of these books break from traditional horror conventions. Like, it's not jump scares. It's not, like, slashers or demons or anything like that. So I'm interested in how you all approach building tension through the ordinary, through the mundane, through the everyday in your storytelling. I mean, my book has a ghost in it. Uh, True, yes. <laughs> and uh, murder. Uh, I mean, I think it's pretty solidly in the realm of uh, like gothic horror where there's, you know, gothic horror is the horror of like the household and uh, kind of like interior decay, uh, which is what the story is also about. It's just like people being trapped in a house together quietly 
destroying each other. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? Oh, just, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm thinking about Gothic Horror, but I'm interested in how you build tension um, in a story where it's more so the ordinary things or the mundane things that are meant to be horrifying and not necessarily like a huge emphasis on the supernatural or a slasher or all the blood and gore <laughs> that we see in like conventional horror stories. One of the things I've been really interested in the past year with horror is what you don't see and how mm. that can often be so much more terrifying when it's just hinted at. And I think with comics, you have such a, it's such a great medium for that because something can happen between panels that you don't see that you're hint at. And I end with your drawings. I feel like just making them slightly off and getting more and more off as you go through the book and how that can just build the tension in the pacing. And, but in less technically, I feel like I, I just like, yeah, I don't know, just trying to keep the pace as it slowly gets more and more and. Yeah, I think, I think like logistically the, the, the formal properties of cartooning, like you're yeah. talking about, like thinking about page turns, thinking about pacing, thinking about what panels, what size. For my book, a lot of it has to do with like color being treated like Dario Argento treats it in Suspiria, or the way in which like a audio soundtrack can, the volume can intensify and so saturation gets turned up or down. Um, the idea of like repeat images and then a lot of for mine, my book in particular, also taking place in like a household, specifically looking at like emptiness and like geometric isolation, mm -hmm. thinking about the tension of a space that is like totally empty. And so then suddenly you start noticing, oh, there's a crack here and that crack grows throughout the story. So again, like the, the iteration, the repeat, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes hesitate to even really call my book horror because it, it is, a, I consider it everyday horror, and there is a literal horror element nearer the end, but so much of the book is about um, kind of this existential dread of being in your 20s and being having these aspirations, but being trapped by a society that doesn't support or help you in any way, and also this kind of lack of motivation and drive when you, um, kind of are making excuses for yourself or you hit a wall at every turn. And so it is this, there is this literal horror element, but the, the real horror of the book is the kind of very real life um, trappings of being in a place in your 20s where you have no direction and no guidance anymore after being in school. So there are kind of dream sequences and hints at what the horror element is throughout the book seated in, but I must feel like that horror surprise, I guess, um, is almost secondary to the real, what the real horror of the book is. And so it kind of just is there throughout the story at, through these interactions with, uh, the main character's name is Bobby, through her interactions with her roommate and her boss and all of these kind of secondary characters in the book. Yeah, it seems like um, you all are comfortable with building tension slowly over the course of your work and your story, as opposed to like overwhelming the reader with like, oh, look at all this scary stuff in the world. Well, it's very difficult to do a jump scare in a comic. Yeah, That's yeah. true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, not, not impossible, but challenging. Yeah. I, it also is like if you're overwhelming constantly with like, oh, look how, look how nasty, look how crazy, like it's, you lose the, the impact of that. Like similarly with the jump scares, like it's such a different medium. It just requires a different approach to that pacing and that storytelling, I think. Right. Actually, we have this other book that I made probably five years ago, something like that. It's called Suicide Forest. And we were playing with this idea of jump scare and how it's really hard to achieve in comics. So what we did is we drew one background, kind of like an animation, where the background stays the same through the entire book and the characters move around on the page and it's it's just a slasher like in one house in one spot but the characters are always in a different spot on the page and so you're having to kind of search for what's different or what's new and then you have the ability to control the way that the reader experiences that jump scare because you're not seeing the next panel from the corner of your eye it's all about the entire page turn and that was an interesting experimental solution for us and I think it works pretty 
pretty well. It's not a very big story, you know, but right. um, it was kind of an interesting way to do something that is really difficult to do usually in comics. Yeah, yeah like trying to manufacture that kind of jump scare. It's hard. Almost impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That makes me wonder, like, have you ever, uh, all, and this is a question for all of you, um, have you ever wanted to put these stories in a different medium? Or is comics like the medium that feels right for the type of story you want to tell when you approach the, the horror genre? I can speak for myself. I have a film background and there's some stories that I come up with that I'm definitely like, you know, this is a screenplay. <laughs> like it's, I it would rely too much on, you know, a jump scare or some other sensory experience that I haven't quite figured out how to put into comics yet. <laughs> yeah. If I wanted to use a different medium, then I would do that. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> I think, you know, there's potential for, like when we made Suicide Forest, so many people would come up to the table and be like, oh, you could see this as a movie. And I think, yes, but there's already movies like that. You know, mm -hmm. we've mm -hmm. seen you know, similar things before and that, that one in particular was an experiment for comics. Uh, and I think for me, I'm more interested in the storytelling mechanics and the formalist qualities of comics and how you make a story interesting in that way. And I'm not opposed to making something into a TV or TV show or a movie, but I think when you're making a book, the intent is to use that medium to tell the story. Right. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it, a lot of my work for this book is informed by prose and informed by film, but I, I would agree, I think ultimately if it, this story has to be a comic, in my opinion, um, yeah. which is why, and comics take forever, so like, <laughs> yes. it would be a really big mistake to be like, actually, I'd prefer it with, you know, I just did it instantaneously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think yeah. sitting with it, there's also the like intimacy of like, holding a physical book or like having an object that is maybe disarming or you think it's going to turn out a different way, you kind of have, have to disarm your reader a little bit. And like, and again, thinking about those properties of, of what does it mean to spend time looking through images? What does this mean mm -hmm. to spend time to hold a thing, have a one-on-one -on -one rather than be in a theater full of other people screaming and shrieking? You know, it's, it's a very different reading experience. Right. Yeah, I think the intimacy of comics makes it a medium that's actually really well suited to horror. Mm -hmm. Totally. Especially that sense of like a creeping type of dread or mm -hmm. something that's inescapable because it's so personal in a way. Yeah, I feel like the most flattering thing is hearing, seeing somebody flip through it and you can hear inside them going, no, 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 <laughs> like the whole read. Cause like yeah. they want to stop, but they don't and they need to find out what happens, but I know it's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes me think of the first time I read um, Black Hole by Charles Burns. Mm -hmm. And like one of the panels, like I was like in my dorm room by myself. I had this like single dorm room, so I didn't have a roommate. And one of the panels just freaked me out so badly. I had to put the book down. It was like vibrating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that I mean yeah. And, and that goes back to again like the the idea of it being a book or it being a comic too is that you know a time-based medium happens to you mm -hmm. versus your participation in like a reading or in a prose or something where like yeah, it is so powerful complicit. yeah you have to sit it you have to set it down you have to walk away from it you have, you're like oh i got nauseous like that impact is totally different mm -hmm. yeah i also think the presence of the object is important like do you remember that experience of childhood where you like have a, there's like a picture in a book that really freaks you out mm -hmm. and then like the presence of the book freaks you out mm -hmm. and you're like <laughs> should I look at it or should I not look at it like I already know that it's there I should just look at it like it's it having the book in your house in your hands having to sit there with the physical object that is the image that scares you like that's all part of the experience that you can't replicate in another medium absolutely yeah, yeah. and you're choosing to like engage like you're running the entire experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we add books to the list of things I'm that now, scare us. Okay. Yeah, I'm scared of books now. <laughs> Great. This is just a 1,000 things that we're afraid of. Yeah, that's the actual name of this panel. <laughs> um, one of the things I was noticing um, in all of these books is that routine is and like representing routine is such a core part of these stories. Um, 
And I'm interested in how you all kind of approached that task because it can be very difficult to show like a repetitive image or something that's done every day. I have a couple examples. Nicole's is on the screen right now. <laughs> and then, we did the same thing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh my God. The resonances. Shit. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Guess we're not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just kind of interested in that, um, like how you approach that task of visualizing routine. Um, and do you get bored <laughs> doing that? <laughs> It can be kind of boring to draw a scene like this, I won't lie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I like the effect of it so much. I really like repeating the same image with small variations. Yeah. I think stats are incredibly effective. Um, I, I think there are certain aspects of comics readers who feel like it's a cop-out um, to do the same image over and over again, um, especially with technology where we don't necessarily have to draw it completely through every time. But I think when you're telling a story that um, you're trying to draw out a moment or you're trying to represent repetition and uh, patterns, I think it's a really wonderful way actually to kind of get that feel through. And, and the way that we both did it of you know descending panels, getting smaller and smaller, <laughs> it, it gets across very quickly that this is not, this happened three times. This, right. is, this is all the time. Right. And this is kind of the monotony and the that stuck feeling of being in the same space over and over and over again. Yeah, and um, yeah, I love how you said that, the monotony of being stuck in the same space. That's very, very accurate. I think also, like, again, and I know I keep, I'm like, I'm like a real advocate for, you know, formal properties is like the simultaneity of the page is, I think, again, something really unique to comics. And so thinking about how for this character, she's like, if this, this particular page is earlier in the book, and she's like, yeah, domestic life, I love it. And she's like doing it over and over, even though she's like on her hands and knees, she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's scrubbing, she's doing like baby preps, packing lunch, and it's just like beep, 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 beep. But the very bottom row is actually something different. Um, and that is to be revealed later on in the book and like hint toward something else that's maybe watching or ominous throughout her work that's just sort of lying under the surface. So for me, the, the joy of this particular page and that kind of monotony is like, A, I'm right there with you, man, with the like, character like, yeah, I'm drawing these freaking panels. <laughs> but <laughs> it's also like, to me, there's that build of like, where does this burst? When is she no longer excited about the routine or the ritual or the monotony? And like, where does ritual turn from like, I guess, spiritual into, like, sacrificial. Mm. Well, and having that repetitive nature of, you know, the routine, if you break that, then there's more emphasis on what it, what it means to break it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems like comics are particularly suited to that kind of work because you can manipulate the page in so many different ways. Like, this page, you have that alternate reality happening underneath the surface, but then... There are, and this is the case in all of your work, there's like other pages that really break the surface of reality um, and kind of show us, you know, um, something that is not necessarily a part of these characters' worlds, um, or something horrifying, right? Ew, yeah, who drew that? <laughs> <laughs> so gross. Gross. <laughs> Coming soon to Fantagraphics. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Gross comics. <laughs> It's a horror film. Just, it's, okay. it's just drawings. Don't worry. It's just drawings. They, they can't hurt you. I've kept the most horrifying ones out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what is that um, process like of like balancing the structure of comics, like the routine and the monotony, versus these moments where we see like a break in reality or we see something that's truly horrifying? Um, how does that feel for you all? Well, don't you think when you sometimes um, you have an experience or a moment where you kind of uh, puncture the reality that you normally are dealing with, all of us are conscious that there's, there's stuff going on below the surface, there's uh, transcendental experiences, there's worlds outside of the phenomenal uh, that we really can't be deal with 
dealing with or be conscious of from right. day to day because we got to do stuff. Right. Uh, but, you know, then you uh, take psychedelics or you <laughs> get the shit kicked out of you or you give birth or you fall in love or like there's a lot of different experiences that kind of uh, reach through the mundane to the divine. Um, and the supernatural can be a way of depicting that or other um, kind of uh, examples of a character piercing the veil, discovering a secret room, um, all those kind of narrative uh, ways of representing that experience. So I think oftentimes horror is uh, at least partially about that, not just our comics, but like any comics or, or any, any horror film or book. Uh, you know, Hellraiser is a, is a favorite of mine um, where the, there's these creatures that appear from another world, demons to some, angels to others. <laughs> uh, but uh, the reason that they come is because people are tired of regular stuff. They feel like they've had every experience and they want to have something that is beyond. Mm -hmm. So these creatures come and they kind of like torture you but also fuck you and like <laughs> it's some kind of experience that like is people don't know what it's going to be uh but it's it's going to be something it's going to be something transcendental yeah and that's you know the desire for that is so profound that uh you will risk a lot to try and touch it i mean people are cave diving and stuff like <laughs> people are doing all kinds of stupid things in order to find that that place yeah i think in in terms of the structure of the comics i'm i'm someone who is pretty interested in formalist comics and so sometimes when i'm making a book i will have this desire to do something new and inventive on every page but when you're doing a book like this using literally just a grid, which sometimes to me feels too boring. Mm -hmm. um, when you put that next to a page where you're breaking the grid and doing a page with no panel borders or mixing it up in some interesting way, it really kind of emphasizes that break from reality or a need to, for something new or a transcendental experience or something. So I'll sometimes be like, no, I don't wanna just do another grid but I have to remember that the juxtaposition of those two things says something in comics, and it's an interesting way to show the horror of something or the magic of something or just something different from, particularly with these stories, which all seem to be sort of about everyday life and, and struggling through just being a person where it's like you're washing the floor over and over and over again, and then all of a sudden, what was it? Tearing fingers open or something, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, a different, the usual. a different structure, a different panel layout, something, and, and it really kind of shows you the difference between um, your real life and then perceived experiences. Right. Yeah, I want to echo that. A lot of my comics that I make that aren't horror, I don't like you doing panels at all. Um, but I found that every time I sit down with for a horror comic, the panels do become so important to like root it in a certain way mm -hmm. and you know similarly like phone stoned at towards the end loses all panels as a way to mm -hmm. you know echo the disorientation i think i do have that is yep. this yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> sorry i was still thinking about losing panels um <laughs> 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 i think uh you know the mm, yeah, I really, I think I really resonate, Julia, with what you were saying about like the transcending. When I was starting the work on this book, I really wanted to have the character's emotional arc be the opposite of the reader's emotional arc. Like, mm -hmm. I want the character to feel like I have reached my transcendence and sublime, sublime moment, but the reader to be the most upset and horrified at the end to have realized what she's become. Yeah, the reader's definitely like, no. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, <laughs> right, and, and uh, you know, it's, it, I think that's really, that dissonance is really interesting to me, and like, whether that's panel-based or um, color-based, but again, that like experiential reality and, and where that is for 
what we're existing in right now versus like what all of us are internally feeling in these various moments and the conflicts of that. Yeah, I think listening to you all talk about um, these like breaks in reality or this like desire for a transcendental moment um, or some sort of escape, it makes me think about how in the pandemic I was noticing we all kind of desire this like escapism of like, I'm gonna binge watch a bunch of shows or like, I'm going to really get into this fantasy series, which was me. <laughs> um, and these stories kind of reject that. It's kind of like the escapism is not a great, not, not a great thing to do <laughs> um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and I feel like there's a section of people who are watching Pandemic, like, wasn't that one of the top movies on Netflix? Oh. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I want to be, feel it the most uh, mm -hmm. yeah. viscerally. I don't want to, I want to see how people going through the worse than we are, how they're handling it. I definitely didn't understand that. I was like, I don't, I don't need any more of this in my life than we already have. <laughs> yeah, I, re I was like, going on a very long like plane ride a couple months ago and I had downloaded Yellow Jackets, the like TV series Hell to my yeah. iPad and I was like, maybe this isn't a great time to watch a <laughs> TV show about a plane crash. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like lunchtime's a good time for that one. That's, that's fair, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, well, I did want to show Nicole's um, break from reality yeah. as well. <laughs> um, my favorite puppy, oh, yes. <laughs> Barkley. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm interested in if you guys are like looking at other media that's horror related while you're creating these stories. Like, do you like horror movies? Are you like, no, horror novels are better? Are you like, I hate horror? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I like novels, but uh, I also am usually reading a lot of um, nonfiction. Okay, cool. That is horrifying. Uh, yeah. Right now I'm reading a book called They Called It Passchendaele. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's pretty gruesome. Um, and also at movies, but not necessarily movies that you would think of as horror movies, although I think they're horrifying. Like or uh, well, like when we were talking about um, showing a transcendental experience, I was thinking of uh, the ending of The Last Temptation of Christ, mm -hmm. which I yeah. won't describe to you because you should see it uh, <laughs> if you haven't. But, um, you know, things like that, seeing how other artists address uh, problems of their medium and uh, I think especially in film, there's a lot of ideas that can be uh, kind of like brought over to comics, uh, mm -hmm. or I think it's a kind of a process of translation because it's not exactly the same, but you can mm -hmm. be like, oh, I could do something similar if I, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and fine art also, I think is important. Yeah, I I've, have I've a big, I'm a big fan of Shirley Jackson and I find that ends up, uh, influencing a lot of the horror I type want to make and I've also been I have been I think reading more recently different horror novelists like Stephen Graham Jones who oh, yeah. I've just like totally horrified by <laughs> and and similarly uh, I get into nonfiction spirals and was reading all about different cults and that kind of thing too as the that's what the next comic I want to make is about how terrifying it is to get into a cult <laughs> and how easy it can be. Oh, we yeah. should talk to each other about that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like next panel. Next I'm not saying I have personal experience, but I might. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I also love, um, you mentioned Stephen Graham Jones. Have you read Only Good Indians? Yes. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Terrifying. Terrifying. <laughs> Couldn't sleep. Yeah. No, I, I was not expecting the twists and turns that that takes. It just... Yeah, he's a master. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just finished his the second in the Indian Lake yeah. trilogy. Mm -hmm. Really loved that. Very different vibe than yeah, no, I, good Indians, but I love the idea of taking someone who's obsessed with horror and putting them in a horror story. <laughs> yeah. 
I've been a lot of prose. I do a lot of audio books because I'm drawing all day. Um, but uh, I've been a lot of prose, and I'm like huge movie buff, like huge horror movie fan. Just TV shows give it all to me. <laughs> um, but I really loved like Rachel Yoder's Night Bitch book, um, which is like horror and performance art. Um, since I also teach at an art school, it's like really funny to me um, to be like, uh Performance is fun. <laughs> and uh, I, Stephen Graham Jones and also um, Grady Hendrix I've been really oh, enjoying yeah. as kind of like spoofy horror. Um, and then really deeply unsettled by some of Sarah Pinborough's books. Um, but really love The Brood. It's one of my faves Fuck movies. Yeah. <laughs> so good. We definitely uh, got the criterion mm -hmm. of The Brood. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like yes. this book is kind of like um, The Brood, Suspiria, both of them, and then also like When Harry Met Sally. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent combination. What a, what a good cocktail, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah I, I never would have considered myself a horror person before. I spent a lot of my childhood avoiding horror because I had like seen some ads for The Grudge and was like, I'll never sleep again. <laughs> um, but I think as I start, as I've begun to write my own stories, it comes out more and more. And, and I've, you know, I had a true crime phase where I listened to a lot of podcasts about mm -hmm. murder. Um, <laughs> and I'm finding more and more that I'm engaging in Particularly, I think because sometimes the movies are a little bit too visceral for me. I'm not a big gore person, mm -hmm. but when it's in book form, it's a little bit easier to digest in that it is still horrifying, but not in the way where I'm going to see it all night when I'm trying to fall asleep. So it's, it's more of this psychological, thought-based idea of horror than it is, you know, the jump scares and the gore. And I think there are plenty of movies that are also that, but... Um, I'm still hesitant to watch some of them, but I, I think I'm much more, and I really think, honestly, at this point, I could watch any of them and be fine, but I, uh, I'm enjoying kind of my, like, little delves into horror, and it's, I never thought I would be a horror writer, but it, it, every story I write seems to be like, oh, this is a weird, gross horror twist at the end. <laughs> I think that's the reason that I wouldn't switch to prose writing, I think, is that the images get under your skin in yeah. a way that prose totally. doesn't. Yeah. Or I'm not going to say never, but I, I think images really stick with you in a more primal way. I think there's, mm -hmm. like, there's like levels of it. There's the like moving imagery of movies, which is probably the most visceral. And then there's comics or fine art, which is static imagery that has often a really like deep impulse and, and effect on you. And then there's words on a page, <laughs> right? Which is still effective. I'm sorry, this is not a great example. Of <laughs> yes, I'm like, look at these you horrifying images. You know when images. you look at a picture and it's just really scary and you can't get it out of your head? Yeah, terrifying. Actually, awesome. this does scare I me. Calling it to avoid, I, I think that's terrifying. Yeah. No, but I mean, and not, none of that is to say that prose is not effective. I think it is, but it's just a different type yeah. of effectiveness. Totally. That makes me curious about what um, images from books or movies or comics um, have stuck with you in that kind of horrifying way. Hmm. Um, for me, it's it like the cover of the VHS tape of it <laughs> was really oh, yeah. <laughs> troubling for me, and now I have it in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm just curious if you can like off the top of your head think of anything. That, like from childhood or just in general? Yeah, just from childhood or generally, just like something that stuck with the, you. I mean, the page that everyone kind of freaked about a little bit ago <laughs> with the, <laughs> the skin, right, and the fingers. Yeah. Um, Black Swan has that moment, mm -hmm. and it yeah. just keeps going. And I was like, bleh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on a horror panel. I should be able to handle yeah. it. It's fine. Uh, the original illustrations of scary stories to tell oh, in the dark yeah. with, yes. like, the, mm -hmm. you know, ink washes. I, like, had to find the original illustrated books to get recently because I was like, why were those so terrifying? <laughs> was that expensive? Were they, are they expensive? I think to... they re-illustrated it and then I think everyone was mad so I do think they started selling the original mm. illustrations again because there's just no beating them. Well, for sure. Um, when I was a kid, I don't know how old, but younger than 10, maybe six or seven, uh, I read 
uh, a novelization of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Um, so the scene where they do the human sacrifice and they rip the guy's heart out and show it to him and then they, they lower him slowly into lava, mm -hmm. that upset me so badly. Uh, I just like couldn't get it out of my head for like weeks. I was like yeah. crying, get to bed with my mother, like it messed me up so bad. And I have to go, goodbye. <laughs> uh, I eventually got over it but I still thought about it a lot. And I had never seen that movie yeah. because I was scared. Uh, and then I finally tried to watch it because my son was watching all the Indiana Jones movies and I could not fucking do it. <laughs> like when it got to that scene, I was like, like <laughs> I, I, I really was gonna just uh, grit my teeth and do it, but I couldn't. Yeah, I kind of like that that's not like a class, it's like an action adventure yeah. type but of story. But that scene is so horrifying. Yes. Like, yeah. why would they put something so incredibly <laughs> disgusting in like a fun movie? <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. True. We it's didn't put the It's kind of mean spirited, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't put the panel, the eye panel from <laughs> Vision in this in the slideshow, oh. but <laughs> um, Maybe there's a resonance there. <laughs> See, now if I put that in the middle of my like middle grade YA novel, then that would be that would be cruel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was um I I don't remember the name of the book, but there's a Terry Brooks fantasy novel series, and so I was really into fantasy as a kid, and I was not expecting it to kind of veer into this fantasy horror elements where there were these, they were basically zombies, but they were like these soul-sucking creatures um, in the book, and I was maybe 10 reading this thing, and it freaked me out so much, because there was, I forget what it was exactly, but there was a pit full of these soul-sucking creatures, and the main characters were like up above them, and they were like reaching for them, and getting their feet or something. So for years, I had to tuck all my covers in the bottom oh, of my oh, bed because yeah. I was like, they're going to get my feet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, still could, honestly. Yeah, for real. I should probably tuck in my sheets tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me check our time. Yeah, A guy just came and stuck his head in the door and went like this. Oh, okay. I don't know if you saw. Um, I didn't see him, but hope, okay. Understood. Does that um, mean we have to go? <laughs> I think we do have like a little bit of time for questions from the audience. There are microphones in the back. If y'all want to head to, if you have a question, you, ha my goodness, head back there, please, so we can hear you. <laughs> and we'll start oh. over on this side. Oh yeah. Oh crap. That was that was really loud. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so question. I feel like when it comes to horror, horror often comes from somewhere or it's about something. Being able to name something is often really powerful. But I feel like at the same time, when you sort of pinpoint something or nail something down, you can almost diminish its power sometimes in that way. Like for a lot of spooky stories for me, if you say this is about this, or even if you say this is a werewolf story or a story with, fa with fairies in it, like you kind of diminish, like sometimes it keeps it, but other times it like diminishes the power as it becomes more concrete. I was wondering as comics artists, how you like navigate that space, how you determine like how much to show, how much not to show, how like whether your work should be about something or whether it's about something more nebulous, mm. that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Kind of like um, how do you make the choice and what to, um, visualize or not visualize in comics, in your comics? Hmm. I don't think that any of the things that I felt starting my comics were neutralized by my depicting them. I think yeah. it was just me uh, trying to write down something that was already present. Uh, I will say I feel like trying to write the synopsis for all of my horror comics is always hard. Oh, yeah. More the way that's the real part. Yeah, horror. that's like <laughs> yeah. I'm like I it is you know continues to be nebulous and it's trying to be like well what is this about? And that's where you know if you were to say this is about this then it would ruin it. <laughs> all really good stories are are premised with a question, yeah. not a not a statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like what mine is about is not what you're seeing like what it's about is a lot deeper than that and so the horror or the spooky or gross stuff you're seeing is like this is a symptom 
of something that's much more upsetting or horrific underneath that you should be taking away, in my opinion, or what I'm thinking about. So it doesn't lose the power in that way for me. Yeah. I do think, you know, I, I've done some interviews about the book and I've had to talk about the book. And because of that, I've sort of, you know, I had ideas of what it was about when I was writing it, but it's not really spelled out in any way in the story. And I think I've kind of veered into talking about what it's literally about, which I think is good for interview purposes, but I would really rather people read the book and get their own feelings about it and, and interpretations from it. Um, so as much as I say it's about this or it's about that or I have these ideas of what it's about, um, I think the, the work itself is very open to interpretation and I think if you just let readers take in your work and understand what that is to them, it doesn't even have to be the same as what the creator is meaning to make. Yeah, that makes sense. It's hard, it, like, um, it kind of takes away the magic to put like such a fine point on things, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yes, over here. First of all, thank you for your conversation. And um, my, uh, first of all, I hope that each of you could uh, please list your table numbers so that I could visit them <laughs> later because uh, I came for Julia's work and then I learned about all the rest of yours and I really want to <laughs> visit and get more horror comics. Anyway, um, all of you have talked about the importance of pacing in your work. It's so crucial to how you build tension. I was wondering if when it comes to your process, you manage to nail that pacing within the thumbnail stage or if you've had any experiences where the pencils or the inks were done and you found that something wasn't right, more art was needed, another page or something needed to be taken away, or whether that process has changed over time or whether it varies from book to book. I, the script is always finalized in the, in the thumbnail stage for me. I can't... Uh, the only time that I change things from the thumbnail to the final is if the thumbnail is so... Uh, primitive that I can't figure out what it was supposed to depict, <laughs> <laughs> which has happened. Uh, and my table is F12A. I'm also signing the very last copies of Vision, uh, the Fantagraphics publication at the Fantagraphics table after this awesome. at one o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've the pacing is usually there in my thumbnails, but I've had a few moments where something I thought was really clear ends up as having a wonderful second reader look at it and that's where I, normally it doesn't change the pacing, it's just like, okay, I need to switch up the clarity here. And what is your table number? And I'm a W17. Yeah, I really want to confidently say, yes, it's locked in, man, <laughs> but uh, I feel like I, I'm not precious about my drawings at all and like, even at this moment, I feel like I could be like, nah, I'll do some other, do another page. I don't know, um, because I really want it to, I want it to sing. So I want it to be right. So I actually added some, like, uh, there's like jumps in time. The book's not entirely linear, and so we go backwards and forwards. And those needed just like an, an extra breath. I thought um, after reading it a couple of times. Um, so I added those in maybe like a week ago. Um, so those weren't ready. Uh, and I'm table H10B for Beth. <laughs> um, yeah, I also usually work directly from a script, like a fully formed script. Um, but for this book, I added many scenes. <laughs> um, I, this book was supposed to be 20 pages, and I think it's 94. <laughs> um, so it really was just about what I felt the story needed, and, and I got to... I didn't do all my thumbnails in one go. I kind of did some thumbs and then some inks and, and back and forth, and by the time I got to the end of the book, or even most of the way through, I went, oh, I really think that this needs more seeding of the mystery or more this or that or more development of this character, and so I went back and added those scenes, and that's not something I usually do, but I think it really improved the book. And I'm at N2. Thank you so much. Thank you, thanks. All right, um, so we'll go back over here. I think we have time for one more question. So um, all of our panelists have given you their table numbers. So if you have burning questions, you can go find them and ask them up on the floor. But cool jacket over here, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, my question is in regards to pitching. 
it feels like these horror comics, it's about that slow burn leading up to like a, like a, what's the word I'm thinking of? It's kind of like the, like the final joke. So it's like leading up to something bigger. How do you pitch that to someone when if you were to show them just a portion of it, it comes across as more mundane while you're building up that tension? Looking for mm -hmm. tips. Thank you. My book was fully finished when I pitched it. So I don't know exactly, or I don't have experiential uh, advice, but I would say that if you know what the end of your book is, put that in the synopsis. You know, you can, you yeah. can describe what it's gonna be, or if you can draw sample pages of those particular scenes if you feel like they're very visceral and need to be seen for the book, you can do them ahead of time. And you know, sometimes you end up redrawing pages for you know, because your style has changed or you've worked out character designs more by the time you're done drawing the book. Um, just make sure that the publisher knows what they're getting and, and can understand what the book is gonna be. Pitching's hard uh, to really make it feel, make the pitch feel like you know the book is gonna feel. It's very difficult, but as much information as you can give them, as much sample drawings as you can give them. I mean, you obviously don't have to draw the whole book ahead of time, but. Yeah. Um... I think it depends on the publisher, depends on your relationship with them, if you're working with an agent, if, you know, what, what the relationship is. I pitched to two places when it was completely written and penciled, um, but had no final art. And I kept being like, yeah, it's gonna have this like crazy color and do this other weird stuff. Um, and uh, I ended up making some sample pages, just like Nicole described. And uh, I think that was helpful, but ultimately I had a lot of doubt because I wasn't, I don't know, I felt, mm, because this is considered, like I've done a lot of self-publishing, but this is considered my first like debut with like a um, bigger name. And so I had a lot of doubt of like, wait, are you sure you know what happens at the end? Like, do you know, are you, are you aware of what you're getting into? Like, you know what's gonna happen? Like, this is, this is not a joke, it's not a joke. <laughs> um, and so I spend a lot of time kind of like being like, all right, I'm gonna walk you through exactly what I'm thinking and where this is going. But that was a much more informal conversation after the interest had already been like, yeah, really interested, wanna talk about it. So it was a lot more casual than I was expecting, um, was my experience. Yeah, I mean, I'm still making mini comics, so I <laughs> so learned hell from yeah. you all too. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't, I don't, I have like an ongoing relationship with Fanagraphics, so they just will publish whatever for me. Trust. Uh, <laughs> Trust, yeah. So, and other than that, I'm just like trash from the gutter. I don't have like professional practices, so. <laughs> Even if I had advice for you, you shouldn't take it. <laughs> I feel like that's good advice. Um. <laughs> no! <laughs> What did they just say? <laughs> All right, um, I wanna make sure everyone has time to get to their next engagements or get to their table, but thank you all for coming out and having such great questions, and thank you to all our panelists. This was really lovely. And thank you to our host, Rachel. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you.